Hi guys, welcome to this quick introductory video on a paddleability ultrasound. My name is Alan Chin and I've been teaching bedside ultrasound to students, residents, fellows, and attendings since starting at All of You UCLA in 2012. The objectives of this video are to cover some common indications for a right upper quadrant or hepatobiliary ultrasound, to review some pertinent anatomy, as well as to discuss the technique for performing a focused bedside biliary ultrasound. So what are the common indications for a right upper quadrant ultrasound? Well, if the patient has a biliary colic pain localized in the right upper quadrant or epigastric area that is worse after eating, or if there is localized tenderness on exam. We'll use ultrasound to look for gallstones, as well as gallbladder wall thickening and edema. If the patient has newly diagnosed pancreatitis, we use ultrasound to see if it is due to a gallstone that has migrated its way down to the common bile duct, to the pancreatic head causing obstruction and leading to pancreatitis. If the patient presents with jaundice, especially painless jaundice, with an elevation in their conjugated or direct bilirubin, we are concerned of biliary duct obstruction, which we can assess with ultrasound. Lastly, if we suspect new or worsening liver disease or an associated complication like portal vein thrombosis, ultrasound is often very, very helpful. Before we get to anatomy, let's first talk about a common limitation to any abdominal ultrasound application, and that is bowel gas. The air molecules will scatter their ultrasound waves so that nothing is visualized deep to the bowel gas. Only solid organs or fluid filled structures allow the sound waves to pass through to what we really want to visualize, and as such, these solid or fluid filled structures are called acoustic windows because they let the sound through. This is like flying a plane and not being able to see the structures below the cloud cover. Sometimes there is a break in the cloud cover, and if you fly your plane just over it, you can see below. This is like using an acoustic window. You can also dive down below the clouds, which you can't really do in abdominal ultrasound, but you can often apply pressure to compress and displace bowel so that you can visualize the structures below. So re remember to be patient and to work on finding acoustic windows, as well as moving bowel and bowel gas away in order to visualize your desired structures. Okay, let's now review the relevant anatomy. We'll identify the portal vein, portal triad, gallbladder, liver, as well as the hepatic veins and the inferior vena cava. So first, remember that the portal vein is composed of the splenic vein here, coming from the patient's left, and the inferior and superior mesenteric veins coming inferiorly here and here. On a transverse view, with the probe placed a few centimeters below the xiphoid process with the indicator dot pointed to the patient's right, you'll see the liver on top around right here. Just below that is the pancreas, which is often hard to visualize here. And just below that is the splenic vein that will course to the patient's right um, and become the portal vein. Below that is the superior mesenteric artery right here. That superior mesenteric artery is seen as a circle with a very thick or hyperchoic border, um, and it's often referred to as the mantle clock sign. Now, many of us don't know what a mantle clock is, so I've stopped referring it to as a mantle clock sign. Now, below the SMA is the aorta, and actually, in between the aorta and SMA, there's a vessel that comes from the left of the patient and courses right into the IVC. This is the left renal vein. Take a look at this short clip. Do you see the liver? Here it is. Pancreas is hard to see, but it's around here somewhere. And uh, you have bowel gas from the transverse colon or stomach to the left right here. And note that the structures deep to this bowel gas right here are not visualized because of that shadowing. Where is the portal vein? Good, it's right here. You see how it merges into the liver right here? Note the very thick or echogenic walls of the portal vein right here. They're pretty bright white. And this portal vein is actually dilated, which is common in patients with liver cirrhosis. Now, what about this right here? It's circular, it uh, has hyperchoic walls. If you said this is the SMA, you are correct. 
And what about this below the SMA that is seen to come from the left and dive into this structure right here? Well, this is IVC right here, and this makes this left renal vein. And below is, yep, you guessed it, the aorta. And right below that, you actually have this hyperechoic ridge right here, and that is the vertebral body. Let's talk briefly about the portal triad. You remember it, right? It's the portal vein, hepatic artery, and common bowel, or hepatic duct. The reason that this is important in ultrasound is that we often can identify the portal vein, and we use this to be able to identify the bile duct, which, if it's dilated, can tell us if there's obstruction distally in the common bile duct or at the head of the pancreas. This is a transverse view of the structures, and yes, it looks like a famous mouse, so we often refer to it as the Mickey Mouse sign, with this being the portal vein, and this being the hepatic artery or bile duct, and vice versa. Now, how do we differentiate one from the other? We can use color Doppler, and this shows flow, so this is the hepatic artery, and this is the bile duct right here. Here it is in long axis, uh, where you can see the portal vein here. Remember that it has hyperechoic walls, and is also typically about one centimeter diameter. The structure on top is either the hepatic artery or bile duct depending on your plane. In order to confirm, we use color Doppler, which shows flow. Bile duct will not show flow, but hepatic artery will definitely show flow. The purpose of this video isn't really to teach you to make measurements per se, but to highlight the anatomy and common disease processes that can take place. So you can perform a measurement of the bile duct from inner wall to inner wall here. Normal is six millimeters plus one millimeter for every decade above age 50. Or you could just remember that the portal vein is about one centimeter in diameter. So a normal bile duct should be half the diameter of the portal vein. If it is larger than that, then chances are you're looking at biliary uh, duct dilatation. Here is, is an example of using color Doppler to find the bile duct. This is portal vein right here, and this is the bile duct above. And you can see that it's much less than half the diameter of the portal vein right here. Now, say you do have biliary dilatation or bil dil. Again, you suspect it if it's greater than half the portal vein diameter. Or sometimes if you see this uh, in the long axis, it'll look like two large vessels side by side. And it'll look like a double barrel shotgun or a tram track. Sonographers and radiologists, yes, are very imaginative. In the short axis, it'll look like one of Mickey's ears is bigger than the other. And if you really want to confirm, you can use color Doppler, and if the vessel has no flow and it's dilated, then that's your bile duct. If you do see bill deal, then think of these causes. Remember to adjust normal diameter range to age, or if they're post-cholecystectomy, they will be dilated. And if it's still dilated and the patient has acute pain, you can think of Maritzi syndrome, which is external compression of the common hepatic duct or, or common bowel duct. You can think of cholelithiasis or stone actually in the common bowel duct that's causing distension um, closer to the liver. If it's called some pancreatitis, it'll do the same thing. And if you have a mass or uh, if you have cancer in the bile duct itself, cholangiocarcinoma, or a mass in the pancreatic head, or in the adjacent duodenum that's compressing the ampulla, uh, you'll also have dilatation of the common bile duct. Okay, now let's talk about the gallbladder. If you can identify the most proximal part of the portal vein, which is here, then you are very close to identifying the gallbladder. Why? Because this segment of the liver where the portal vein enters or the porter hepatis, the door to the liver, it leads directly into this fissure known as the gallbladder fossa. And within that is actually the gallbladder. And if you find the porter hepatis, you, it just takes a, a little bit of tilting and fanning and rotation and you'll get something like this where you have the, the fundus of the gallbladder, the body, and then the neck. And you'll note this is the portal vein. Um, and if you 
kind of flip this vertically, it'll look like an exclamation mark. So this is often referred to as the exclamation mark sign. Now the gallbladder is a very mobile organ. It can change orientation as a result of body positioning as well as the respiratory cycle. With that said, there are some general rules for orientation in a supine patient. First, the fundus is usually anterior, whereas the neck is often posterior. Second, the fundus is often inferior to the neck, which is often superior. And this has to do with how it lies in the liver and how the liver folds inferiorly. Third, often the fundus is more lateral to the neck. So this is more lateral and the neck is more medial. So there are two basic approaches to finding the gallbladder. You can place the probe underneath the costal margin, about here, for a subcostal approach. This will allow you to perform a sonographic this will allow you to perform a sonographic Murphy sign, which is more reliable than the physical exam equivalent. The major disadvantage is that you have to deal with all this bowel gas here. In order to avoid as much bowel gas as possible, have the patient take a deep breath and hold it. This inspiratory pause will shift the diaphragm inferiorly along with the liver and the gallbladder, and it will allow you to visualize the gallbladder much better. Now the second approach is to place the probe in an intercostal space like right here. This allows you to use the liver as your acoustic window. I do recommend that you use a smaller footprint uh, phase array probe for this. And the major disadvantage to going intercostal is that you cannot perform the sonographic Murphys. Next, pick a body axis or plane and fan or tilt from side to side. And when you do this, take a note of where the gallbladder is and its orientation, meaning do you see it in long axis or short axis, or does it look oblique? Next, you will want to rotate the probe and see if it changes the gallbladder orientation. If you start with a subcostal approach with the indicator pointed to the patient's head, there are typically three orientations for the gallbladder. The first is an anterior posterior. This looks like the exclamation mark is completely vertical. To obtain a short axis view, you can't just rotate the probe. Instead, you have to go coronal or in uh, the mid or posterior axillary line to find a short axis view of the gallbladder. The second orientation is a superior neck and inferior fundus. So here's the neck and here's the fundus right here. And in order to obtain a short axis view, you, all you need to do is just rotate the probe 90 degrees. The third common orientation of the gallbladder is lateral with the fundus found laterally and body and fundus more medially. When you have the indicator dot pointed to the patient's head, the gallbladder will appear in cross section or short axis. And in order to get a long axis view, you need to rotate the probe 90 degrees and you'll get your long axis. This is an example of a gallbladder image in short axis. The sonographer is fanning or tilting the probe to image the gallbladder from fundus to neck. And this is a gallbladder in long axis where you have the fundus here, the body, and the neck. What do you guys think this vessel is? That's right, it's the portal vein. And then what about this on top? You got it, it's the, the biliary duct. Okay, let's say you find this on your sagittal view, i.e. your subcostal approach with the indicator pointed to the patient's head. Well, you recognize the fundus here. This is the body, and this is the neck from top to bottom. Right, so this is an anterior-posterior orientation. So how do you find the short axis? Well, you have to go coronal, which is going to that mid or posterior axillary line, and you'll be able to image the short axis. Okay, what about this orientation? Here's the neck, here's the body, and here's the fundus. The indicator dot is pointed towards the patient's head, so the neck is superior, whereas the fundus is inferior. So this is a superior inferior orientation or inferior superior gallbladder. And in order to get the short axis, what do you need to do? That's right, you need to rotate the probe 90 degrees and you'll get your short axis view. There are some reasons for not finding the gallbladder. One, if they've had it removed. Remember, history taking is very important. Second, in morbidly obese patients, it may be difficult to image. Bowel gas is a constant nemesis, 
And if you can't image it after employing the inspiratory pause and using your intercostal windows, try to have the patient rotate to his left in a left lateral decubitus position. This will usually shift the gallbladder more superficially and displace some of the bowel to the left. Sometimes there is also a big gallstone in a contracted gallbladder. You will see a wall echo shadow or west sign. We'll talk about this more later. Lastly, you can have someone who has recently eaten and has cholecystokinin circulating and therefore a contracted gallbladder. These may be difficult to image because the gallbladder is really thin. This is a gallbladder in short axis with a large stone. Don't see anything distal to the stone because it's got shadowing. And so you have the wall, the echogenic rim of the stone, and the shadowing. So this is a wall echo shadow. Know that this is a gallbladder in short axis, so if you rotate the probe 90 degrees, you'll usually get a long axis view, and it'll make it much more apparent that this is a large stone in the gallbladder. These are some examples of cholelithiasis. So here is a gallbladder with several small, tiny stones. And here's a gallbladder with one large, big stone right here. Note that the, in both instances, the wall, the gallbladder wall, is nice, uniform, and thin. And so there's no edema or inflammation of the wall. This is an example of cholecystitis. You have an irregular, thickened wall with edema surrounding the gallbladder or pericholecystic fluid, or PCF. In addition, if you compress the, this inflamed gallbladder, it'll cause intense pain and respiratory splinting. So you'll have a positive sonographic Murphy sign. Okay, we're almost done. Let's take a quick look at the liver. This is a normal liver, where there's uniform echogenicity throughout. Nice and smooth, the surface of the liver right is here, and there are no nodules or bumps. Now take a look at this liver. This is a cirrhotic liver. Know how echo dense it is or uh, echo janky it is, and it's because scar tissue has taken place of normal liver tissue. And also, you see how like it's irregular and nodular on the surface. There's also tends to be ascites here. There are some measurements you can perform to estimate liver size. If you measure the liver length in the mid clavicular line, it should be less than 15 centimeters. If you obtain a coronal measurement, the length from the superior pole to the medial edge of the liver should be less than 20 centimeters. However, there is a lot of variability to these measurements, and plus, they're a little time consuming to perform. So what I would recommend is that you just take a global view and take a look at that inferior liver tip right here. If it extends past the inferior pole of the kidney right here, you're looking at someone who probably has a patomegaly. This person also has some acidic fluid here. Lastly, we'll take a look at the hepatic veins. They are thin walled structures here and here, and they descend and drain into the IVC posteriorly right here. It's like a radial pattern. You can see that? So these are hepatic veins, and sometimes they are dilated uh, beyond a centimeter or so. And if you see that, you're actually looking at probably evidence of reversal of flow and uh, this is pretty common in patients that have congestive heart failure as well as pulmonary hypertension. Thanks again for watching this video. I know there's a lot of material, so please feel free to watch segments over and over again, as well as to read up on any areas of interest. Also, in terms of ultrasound technique, practice is the only way to get better, so keep practicing. And lastly, if you have any questions or comments, feel free to email me here. Thanks again for watching, and goodbye.